Welcome to another Foss North. I would like to start by thanking our gold sponsors, our silver sponsors, our base sponsors, and our partners from the community. Welcome back. I hope you all enjoyed your lunch. Uh, I would like to uh, to welcome uh, Anne-Marie from uh, Internet Stiftelsen to the stage. Welcome, Anne-Marie. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm from the Swedish Internet Foundation, which is an independent private foundation that works for the positive development of the Internet, as it says. We are running the Swedish top-level domains, .se and .nu. And I'm going to talk about signing the internet root zone and what that means. My day-to-day -day work is as Chief Information Security Officer as the Swedish, at the Swedish Internet Foundation. I also want to consider myself as a public educator, talking a lot about threats and risks and how we can better manage security issues on the internet. 2001, Bruce Schneier stated that the internet is too complex to secure. One of the reasons is that it's too complex to understand. That doesn't mean that nobody is trying. And my focus today will be on secure DNS, the domain name system. Well, DNS is one of the most important protocols on the internet and a very old one too. Uh, by the end of the 70s actually, and beginning of the 80s, the internet started to expand in a pace that made it difficult to keep track of all the hosts and their addresses. The situation becomes unstable. And at the moment there existed a few different proposals for solutions and the newly graduated computer science student, Paul Mokapetris, is the one who is given the task of developing a compromise based on these former initiatives. He doesn't obey to that. Instead, he takes the opportunity to develop something completely new based on an idea he has worked with on a smaller scale before. With the help of his boss, John Postel, he develops a new system for naming on the internet where he proposes that all names should include one, names, for example, Internet Stiftelsen, and two, category or purpose, for example, .com for commercial purposes or .edu for education. And the implementation of the first name server goes by the name Jeeves. And the pro protocol itself is described in RFC 1033, 34, and 35. Unlike the previous central registry, the domain name system is automated and distributed across many computers and servers on the network, making it both scalable, more resilient, and capable of operating without a central organization. Marco Petris himself has said that he imagined that it could work with up to 30 million addresses. Today, there are over 330 million domains, and the technology still works in almost the same way as when it started. But it didn't take long before someone found serious weaknesses in the DNS protocol. In 1990, Steve Bellowin describes cache poisoning for the first time, but the secret was kept until 1995. In 1994, RFC 1591 states the top-level domain responsibilities. In March 1994, the structure of the domain name system was added when John Postel was looking for a way to organize the database on top of .com, .net, .edu, .gov and what we had by that time. He quickly discovered that there was an ISO standard with country codes, ISO 1531, for two letter codes, which was used for postal use, but that could also be used to organize DNS geographically rather than functionally. And the country code top level domains were born. 1997, the first version of DNS standard documents are published and we had a workshop in 1999, which proved that nothing worked and the engineers had to get back to the drawing board. We have DNS uh, the DNS is, um, <clears throat> of course, victim on uh, different opportunities to attacks, and this picture shows the attack tree of the domain of the domain name system, and uh, DNSSEC protects against some of it, but not all. Everything on the left side, which means data corruption, is what DNSSEC covers, such as cache poisoning when corrupt DNS data is introduced in a resolver's cache and causes the name server to return an incorrect IP address, which redirects traffic to another computer, or DNS hijacking, 
by malicious code causing a computer's TCP IP configuration to point to a fake DNS server controlled by an attacker or by modifying the behavior of a trusted DNS server. So it does not act according to internet standards. And such modifications can, of course, be made for evil reasons, such as phishing. Oh, there you go. Somewhere here, it all started. This photo is taken by Patrick Feldström, and I was a young civil servant working for the Swedish ICT Commission. I had fell in love with DNS at first sight, and now I wanted to make sure that its user got proper protection. And we managed to attract engineers from different parts of the world who all had an interest in developing secure DNS. And there is a lot of other internet protocols that are depending on DNS, but the information and DNS resolvers has come to be so vulnerable to attacks that you can't trust it any longer. Uh, the added level of security that DNSSEC offers means that many attacks don't have the effect that was expected. So DNSSEC protects internet users from tampered or fake DNS data. And also it can be used to securely distribute attributes from other security protocols and solutions. And I will get back to that later. <clears throat> I'm sorry. With the NSEC, you will get the same domain validated trust as you will from a certification authority, even better. Uh, revocation, for instance, takes place immediately and it's a more robust and reliable internet interact with DNS. No more lies in DNS. Trust services built on top of DNS um, is something you can gain from. If we, for instance, eliminate the CA, Certificate Authority Threshold, a large scale development of secure communication will be possible, in my opinion, at least. So what we want from DNSSEC is, as I said, to protect our users, uh, DNS users. And uh, what has it to do with me or with the Swedish Internet Foundation, Internet Stiftelsen? Well, first of all, we started very early. As I mentioned, 1999, we had a workshop uh, and we continued to do that work for several years. And 2005, we were ready to sign .se and we were the first top level domain that implemented DNSSEC after years of, of hard work actually. And others started to think of DNSSEC for quite some time, actually. We didn't really manage to get our other colleague uh, top-level domains on board. So there was not a massive change uh, in a short time. But in 2008, security researcher Dan Kaminsky discovered a new weakness in the DNS protocol, which reduces the time to perform a successful attack against DNS from many hours uh, or days, even down to minutes, and the world shivers. Sadly, Dan passed away earlier this year and he will be missed in the community. So DNSSEC can handle authentication of a region. What is the source where the, the response from the query comes? It can verify data integrity because uh, if you validate the signature and compare that to the key, you know, that is from the right source as well. And nobody has been tampering it with it over the, on, on the communication, during communication. And authenticated response to queries about the non-existing domains, which was the tricky part. How can we explain that a question that doesn't really get an answer can be signed and validated? But engineers, you know who they are, they solve problems and they manage to do that. Um, but th this is for DNS data and DNS data only. So DNS can't handle confidentiality as such, but it's still uh, clear text. Verification of the identity of the person behind the domain name, which the registrant is, no. And it can't stop criminals from using the internet. I often get a question about how secure is DNSSEC? Well, my response to that is usually it is as secure as the underlying cryptographic algorithms. It is as secure as the implementation and as secure as it is operated. So it's very important to make sure that you have everything in order to make sure that you run a secure DNSSEC implementation. 
So 2005, we started to work on ICANN to convince them that the root zone should be signed. And after years of pressure from the Internet Society, and after very careful preparations, the root zone was signed in, in uh, 2010. So in order to, to sign the root zone that's taking care of the DNS for the entire Internet all over the globe, there, of course, is um, needing a very thorough design to protect the DNS trust anchor. So what would, would they do to make sure that everybody feel uh, trust in the process and in the routines? Well, I don't know whether you know that, but there are two Swedish guys, Fredrik Junggren and Jakob Schlüter from Cure, who were part of the design team who came up with how the root zone should be signed and how the routines and process, processes should look like. And they wanted to have trusted community representatives. And the trusted community representative uh, was selected. And there were some criteria and the selection process. So you, the text was saying, while strong technical knowledge of the internet is not a determining factor in TCR selections, they were expected to be committed to the security of the DNS and knowledgeable uh, about the environment in which I can operate. And there was um, uh, required criteria like persons of integrity, objectivity and intelligence with reputations for sun judgment and open minds. So I said, OK, that's me. I will apply to get one of those TCR uh, point, uh, appointments. And uh, <clears throat> each of the persons who can help I can represent the broadest cultural and geographic diversity consistent with meeting the other criteria set forth in, in, that, um, in that document. And to be honest, I am the only woman, uh, but at least there's one so far. And, uh, we had represent, have representatives from all the continents. So there are two data centers. One is in El Segundo, Los Angeles, California, and the other one is in Termark, Culpepe, Culpepe, Virginia. This is on the East Coast, the other one is on the West Coast. I uh, actually belongs to the team that works with the East Coast, Culpepe. There are seven seven crypto officers, I will get back to what that is on for each site. And there's also, we have a backup team as well with persons that is ready to, to jump in if someone wants to step down. There's a lot of focus on physical security. As you see, we have, this is different types. I will get back to that as well and to explain what that means. Um, the, the building that was on this, you can see, uh, I haven't, noted it in red, but this is one of the buildings in this complex that is is uh, containing uh, or, or representing tier one. And tier two is another part of the building um, and tier three is a vestibule, tier four is a ceremony room and tier five is the safe room. So I used to like to think about this as a matroshka doll, you know, layer by layer and uh, with security and checks between and the devil is in the details so even the the walls are um, extra strengthened to make sure that nobody can just walk in from somewhere there where there isn't a door and there's a lot of of course a lot of restrictions and a lot of notice this is the, from the from the lobby where you check in you sign in uh, with in the book with hand, by, by hand, by pen. And to get into this vestibule, you need to be uh, escorted by two ICANN uh, staff members. So I don't have access to the inner kernel by myself, not the physical access. So the physical controls means that there are two individuals jointly for each operation, and there is separation of duties, there's external monitoring, there are cameras, there's sensors, uh, movement sensors, seismic sensors, others, uh, and much, much more. Uh, the sensors, for instance, uh, are quite sensitive uh, when it comes to, to uh, shocks. Somebody by accident closed 
one of the safe doors a little bit too hard, uh, and which re resulted in the, the safe to lock itself up. It was not really easy to get in there again. So this is the cage and what it looked like. We have two safes. One is containing all the equipment needed to perform. The, the key ceremony, which is a computer and, and the HSM, of course, and some cables and stuff like that. And safe two is where we keep all the credentials. And it can get somewhat crowded when we are there all together, the crypto officers together with the ICANN staff member. And um, yeah, everything is uh, documented in a detailed script that we follow from very, very detailed, I would say. It's everything from, you can see for yourself, uh, 39 CA inserts USB port expander into laptop, and then we check that and have a time stamp on it as well. Uh, and there are hundreds and hundreds of checks like this. And this is safe too, where you can see the deposit box inside the safe. And one of the deposit boxes, the one to the downside left corner uh, is mine. And that is where I keep the credentials, the smart cards. And as you can see, there are two uh, key, uh, two locks on each deposit box, which means that the ceremony master has to have one key put into the lock and turn. Uh, and I have my key, which is a physical key, where I put in and turn. And with that two together, we can open the deposit box. Uh, all equipment is kept in tamper-proof evident bags uh, to make sure that nobody has been middling, fiddling with it in the, in the meantime between ceremonies. And I always carefully check my bags before I take out my smart card. And we have in these plastic bags, we have smart cards in plastic box as well because after every key ceremony, we have a meeting where we go through what we went good and what went not so good, maybe, if we had any uh, incidents or something that we had to note for next time. And uh, every time we come up with something that is can be at least considered as an improvement, uh, and we wanted to make sure that nobody could just put a needle through the plastic bag and in that way trying to read the content from the smart card. I have no idea personally if it's even uh, possible, but someone probably know that better. So we put the smart cards in plastic boxes and there we go. One more, one more barrier. And everything is uh, <clears throat> transparent, it's recorded and it's streamed. So anyone can follow the key ceremony if you are interested. Uh, it takes a couple of hours or three. Um, and usually it's uh, quite boring because nothing exciting happens, which is good. We don't want any excitement in this phase, actually. And everything is handled with great care. You have to be very careful, for instance, when you manage the HSM, because that is also um, tamper sensitive. If you put that down too hard on the table, well, then it will destroy the key material, for instance. Uh, we don't have the worst, the worst level of uh, tamper proof because there is some level where you, if you only tilt the HSM a bit, it will destroy the key material. But if since we are handling the HSM, taking it from the safe to the ceremony room and back, we can't take the risk. And so, so we had decided not to go to that level. And everything is very clearly marked and has its own position in the, on the table, as you see with the red stripes there and, and signs. This is a result of a discussion we had after one key ceremony. Uh, this contact is stripped because we want to make sure that no one has tampered it. 
the only the cables that are there should be there and nothing else. So that's the reason why it's naked. And the smart cards and equipment are rolled. Uh, so we have more, we have two HSM, two uh, laptops. We have seven crypto officer for each uh, site, as I said, uh, but there's only use for three at a time. So it's uh, three out of seven. Uh, but that means we have we we try to make sure that we we make use of of everything in order and alternate it so we know that it's working still because this is only only done every six months and between the times nothing is you know nobody touches it and and the, it's a it's the risk that something would stop working. Uh, yes, every all the equipment are redundant, and we keep two of everything. And yes, you have to roll up your sleeves like a magician. Nothing here, nothing there, only in HSM. <laughs> that was also the result of a, a comment from some external, I think, uh, who wanted to make sure that uh, the ceremony master didn't hide anything in his um, jacket, so he had to take it off. But still, we have a dress code. <laughs> And this person is from VeriSign. VeriSign sends uh, a key signing request to ICANN. Uh, and ICANN perform the key signing uh, at the ceremony. So what this person does, he has to identify himself by showing his passport. He reads the PGP word list from his paper that he sent to ICANN. And we read it from the screen because he turns back to the screen and we validate, the people in the room validate that it's uh, the same KSR, uh, key signing request. And there's another, uh, a number of roles that I can have during the key ceremony. We have the ceremony master, as I said, who is holding and leading the ceremony through the entire script. We have uh, internal witnesses, that is I can staff observing and recording the ceremony and make notes of anomalies if something happens everything will be noted as an exception. And there's system administrator, of course, uh, ICANN technical staff member responsible for the systems environment. And we have safe security controllers. And that is ICANN staff members operating the safes. So their only role is to open the safes and close the safes. And they're different from the East Coast and the West Coast. Additional roles is the active roles that I was talking about. The crypto officers are the ones who are uh, part of managing the key signing key. And the crypto officers, their task is to activate the KSK, which is inside HSM. Then there is another um, group of people who is called the KSK recovery key shareholders. Their task is to protect parts of a symmetrical key used to encrypt or decrypt a backup copy of the KSK that ICANN stores. Should it be <clears throat> a situation where nobody can go to the US, and uh, we cannot ca enter either the West Coast or the East Coast data center, well, in that case, plan B must be activated and we need to find somewhere else to bootstrap the entire, um, the entire situation with uh, a new HSM, and then the KSK recovery key shareholders will gather together. Um, and I will get back to that more in details. Crypto officers have physical keys, yes, to the safe deposit boxes that holds the smart cards used to activate the HSM. And the thing is that I can, cannot generate a new KSK or sign the Zoom signing keys without the presence of at least three. There's always four invited because something can happen, you know, people can get ill or miss the transfer uh, or something like that. And they must have the ability to travel to the US twice a year per site, as I mentioned before. So get back to the key recovery shareholders. Well, they also keep smart cards, uh, which contains shares uh, from the key used to encrypt the KSK stored in the HSM. And in that case, five out of seven uh, are K. SH cards together with a smart card holding the encrypted KSK can reconstruct the KSK in a new HSM, as I said. Uh, the smart card with the encrypted backup KSK is managed by ICANN. They, the, the key recovery shareholders, 
they must have the ability to travel with very short notice and we say hopefully never uh, there's a performed an annual inventory <coughs> of the key recovery shareholders meaning that they have to send in a selfie with the, the smart card and the front page of the newspaper of the bidet to verify that they still are in possession of that smart card because they have never been called for um, so that is interesting now we have what 2021 this was 2010 would be interested to see whether that works or if we need to do something else um, something that i can probably think about right now uh, how to how to develop and improve the process and the routines and sometimes a crypto officer is replaced. If somebody wants to step down, there needs to be a replacement. And that is a certain kind of a ceremony as well. It happens a couple of times. The uh, couple of the different reasons, somebody just don't want to do it anymore. Or, or in some case, uh, I think we had a person who used to be a crypto officer who got uh, start, went to ICANN uh, as a staff member. And in that case, you cannot continue as a crypto officer. And there are two types of key ceremonies, generating new chaos case that have happened twice, um, 2010 and 2018, and managing the soon signing keys and the soon signing key signing requests. Uh, and what we're doing is signing soon signing keys for the next quarter, which means it happens four times a year. And it means it's alternating between the US East and the US West Coast. Uh, I don't know whether I have a, a picture of that, but I see, I, otherwise I will tell you what we have done during the pandemic. So we can agree that DNSSEC today is a standard procedure. We have a lot of routine and, and experience from the ceremonies. And you can participate from home, as I mentioned, uh, make sure that you have tons of popcorn because uh, it's not, it's not very, very exciting. Sometimes it is, too. Uh, I was looking at the picture from um, how it looks like in .sc. Uh, in the .sc zone, it's 43% um, um, less than 50, actually, that are signed, which is a pity, if you ask me. Uh, um, and I don't think that is that many countries that beat that result. There are some, but we are working on it in different ways. And the keys, yeah, the key signing key rollover in 2018. The reason behind that was that first, ICANN had actually promised the community to roll the key after five years. Now that didn't happen because uh, I can find, and the community found out that, mm, I don't think we are, prepared for that. But the primary reason for rolling the key is just operational preparedness. I mean, the key signing key has no expiration date. It's currently no weaknesses. But you know, no key should live forever. That is bad crypto practice. And the DNSSEC practice statement states that the key will be rolled sometime. And it's preferable to exercise the process uh, during normal conditions as opposed to abnormal, such as a key compromise, for instance. But as you can realize, it involved a big challenge, countless uncountable participants, for instance, every single name server or every single domain holder could be affected by such a rollover. And there's no test environment that can cover all possibilities. So it was very, very um, carefully planned and, and managed by ICANN. So it was postponed, I think it was postponed one year um, from the beginning. Um, uh, but it actually happened and it was no big deal with uh, the results at hand. But as with any system, maintenance work is regularly necessary and carried out by ICANN staff and contractors performing specialized functions. Uh, in the days leading up to the most recent ceremony at the West Coast facility located in El Segundo, California, there were re replacement work of the safes was scheduled as the original locks 
they were being end of life by the manufacturer. And uh, this meant that these locks would be opened one last time and then be replaced. As luck would have it, while the replacement took place without incident on one of the safes, when attempting to perform the replacement on the second safe, the installed lock failed and no longer opened the safe. So when then proceeded to schedule the safe intervention, which basically means that a certified locksmith has to access the safe room and drill through the safe to release the lock. Initially, they said it should take a matter of a few hours. Uh, it turned out to be a two day event. While it may, may sound strange that one could just start drilling into this kind of equipment, this is in fact the manufacturer indicated method of dealing with this sort of mishap. And there's all the materials and instructions to carry it out are readily available. And you need to be very careful. You can see in the, the picture on the down part of this slide where he peeks into the hole, the drilled hole. Uh, if you drill too far, the safe will go in lock completely. It doesn't matter how much you are, are trying to, to open it. There will be no way except for very brutal ways. So that was uh, an interesting key ceremony, but I was not a part of it uh, because that was on the West Coast. Now, um, signing a, a response, a DNS response on a request means that someone could validate in the other end. If you're signing DNS responses, but no one bothered to validate the signature, then you haven't gained anything from what DNSSEC offers. In Sweden, we are very lucky. Most of our ISPs validate signatures in DNS. You see the, the green part there. Uh, the same goes for Finland, Iceland, and some other parts of the world. And there are some useful tools for testing DNSSEC. We have ZoneMaster uh, from Internet Stiftelsen and our uh, counterpart in France, AFNIC. That is a joint project where we uh, where you can test DNS and DNSSEC and, and connectivity as such. And then there, yeah, you have the DNSSEC analyzer from VeriSign Labs, and we have DNS this, which is a DNS visualization tool uh, from Sandia. I, I am the kind of person, I love toolboxes. I love the possibility to be able to check myself for whatever I want to look for. Uh, with not much of, of, a, of a fossil. So this is very, very good. And you can actually check if the domain is signed. Uh, this is more of, of a, it was a, a sort of very quick hack made by two, two guys on, a, I think it was some kind of 24 hour uh, hack competition or something like that, a gathering. And they asked if they could could borrow my face and I said yes of course you can just use it and you can try it and if you find a domain that is signed you will see a much much nicer face and current statistics on top level domains with DNSSEC uh, right now is that is a total of uh, 1498 TLDs where of 1,371 are signed. Um, there was um, a, quite a, a big improvement when the new GTLDs came around because I can had DNSSEC as a mandatory requirement on the, the new top level domains. Uh, but that doesn't mean that all the secondary level domains are signed in that zone either. So we have a quite some time uh, left before we reach uh, an acceptable level of DNSSEC deployment, if you ask me. And here is, um, again, you can see the growth, uh, which is, of course, very good at this as a kind of steep curve anyway. But no, I don't have uh, the key to the internet. I just uh, um, I am part of a very, very interesting and quite important uh, ceremony and process to trying to make DNS 
and internet a little bit, a little bit safer for users. And I'm actually stopping there. So you can have a look at me and we can have a chat. All right, great. Thanks for a good talk. Uh, I have been uh, monitoring the uh, YouTube chat and uh, pick up a few questions. Um, I'm sorry I... for the for the pace. I am quite a fast speaker. I hope it didn't <laughs> prevent uh, anyone from. from... Fine. <laughs> okay, good. Thank yeah. you. We will have more time for questions then, please. So. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. So uh, the first question was re related to uh, the original do domain name system, Jeeves. Is that the reason why the old search engine was called Ask Jeeves, if you know? Yeah, right. I think uh could be. I'm not sure. But it sounds like a logical explanation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned this uh, plan B, if no one can join to the to the locations. Uh, has that yeah. been used during the pandemic or how have you managed during the pandemic? No, during the, yeah, I, thank you for asking that. Uh, during the pandemic, we, we used uh, the contingency plan that has been in place. Of course, every important system uh, shall have a contingency plan, which meant that um, since nobody could travel to the US, we decided to uh, use courier uh, and some of the crypto officers actually sent their uh, physical keys by courier to trusted parties in the US, people they've been knowing for a very long time that could uh, attend and, and be part of, of, the, of the key ceremony. That said, we also, or I can also um, try to make sure that uh, no more people than was absolutely necessary had to attend at the same time. So two times they have performed this kind of key ceremony where we have uh, sent the keys physically uh, by career and uh, with less people than usual. Uh, and what the, the conclusion from that was, okay, why don't we just generate and sign keys for a longer period, not just one quarter, but three quarters uh, in that in that way, we could um, actually manage to to prolong uh, the requirement for people to to travel to the U.S. So that oh, is what we yeah. so so we did it since the pandemic is a pandemic; it's everywhere. So it doesn't have make any sense to to gather people somewhere else, and uh, because the situation was the same uh, globally. Right. Right. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, so, this uh, how does this work with signing the DNSSEC? Uh, how does that work relating to uh, the work that's been done with using DNS over HTTPS? Is there is there any place where these two sort of join in the middle? Oh, um, DNS over HTTPS. Well, th that's so. That is something different in in the sense that you move uh, the DNS part up to the application level. Uh, you will probably still need DNSSEC. Uh, so I will not speculate. I'm not a technician in that sense. I, I'm not really sure. I'm sure there are other people who are much better uh, in, in responding to that. I pass. Mm -hmm. All right. Maybe someone in the YouTube comment section can give a, a technical comment on it as well. Uh, let's see. I don't think we have that many more questions uh, on the chat. So I, I was thinking about one thing. I read in the news, I don't remember when it was, that there was an issue with the physical safe a while back when there was yeah. going to be a key ceremony. Was this the replacement lock thing? Uh, Yes, the way I, I, believe I remember it was. it was that someone had misplaced the key, but maybe that was not the case then. Uh, no, no, um, no. So, to, to be honest, these safes are, they have quite complicated locks, and they're always very, very hard to, to open. It's a uh, high pressure on the safe openers, because you first have to, to roll um, 
it's a, sort of a generator to get some power up first in your before you can even see uh, see the code and then you have to be in very very perfect position to to see the digits that is shown and it's always very 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 difficult um but still the, i think the the thing you are are what I was reading about was that the lock didn't uh, open at all because uh, it has stopped functioning. We had uh, one issue, but that was in, I think that was already on the first key ceremony where someone forgot his physical key in the, in the lunchroom at the data center. So we immediately had to replace uh, the, the deposit box for one, one uh, part. Uh, which was yeah, so that was the first ceremony was very very long because everybody needed their credentials. And we were all seven of us in place, uh, and on top of that, it was the key recovery shareholders. I think we were about six seven hours in that key ceremony room. In in that the oh yeah, so not yeah. not everyone in the safe room. No, safe no, no 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that would have been terrible. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, there was another question that came in now. Uh, so uh, why do you think companies like, say, Google have public resolvers for DNS that work over TLS, but they still haven't done anything with DNSSEC? And, and the, mm. the person who asked the question also commented that maybe that also falls under too much speculation. But if, if you have an yeah, idea... Yeah, well, then... exactly. You know, we, we are actually trying to convince uh, big players uh, such as Microsoft and Google and others over the years. but. I think that you're better off then. I've been working uh, on that with Microsoft. I have put in the request. You know, they have this certain part of their support site where you can add your what you want from them. And DNSSEC has been on my wish list for a very long time. And I think that that's a, it's about to happen. Um, but it took some time. I don't know, uh, to be honest, why. Hmm. All right. Yeah. Um, all right, I think uh, that is the last uh, question we have from the from the comment section. Uh, thank you for a great talk. It's uh, lovely having you. And, thank uh, you for having me. It's fantastic. Yeah. I like your conference. And I hope Johan can take over to say something about uh, the schedule. I, I will jump in and say that the next session starts at two. So it sounds like we'll get a coffee break. That's what I will ah. do in the next 15 minutes, at least. You can uh, thank me for that afterwards. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Coffee's on me next time I'm in Stockholm. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Take care.